Our scripture lesson today is from the Old Testament prophet Micah. And so I share with these with you these words beginning with verse 6 of chapter 6. With what should I approach the Lord and bow down before God on high? Should I come before him with entirely burnt offerings with year old calves? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and with many torrents of oil? Should I give my oldest child for my crime, the fruit of my body for the sin of my spirit? He has told you, human one, what is good and what the Lord requires from you to do justice. Embrace faithful love and walk humbly with your God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, my dear friends, I stand before you today as one who has deep roots in the United Methodist Church. But I am curious how many of you grew up United Methodist? Raise your hand. All right. How many of you did not grow up United Methodist? Wow. What do you think? About half and half? Yeah, we've got a lot of people who did not grow up being enmeshed in the history of the United Methodist Church, and yet somehow you found your ways into the doors of this church and I hope that you found it to be a warm and welcoming and opening and affirming place as you seek to learn more about who God is and who you are but even if you are like me and you grew up as a United Methodist sometimes we don't know our history Sometimes we forget how we all began and why this denomination started to begin with. And right now in the point of history where we are as a denomination, I think it's very important that we go back and we look at our roots. Not so much to embrace our past as we think nostalgically about the good old days, but to embrace our roots. Because you see, sometimes there is a difference between embracing the past and embracing your roots. In embracing our past, sometimes we hold on to things that are outdated and no longer work in the world. And we lament that lostness of the past. But when we cling to our roots and hold on to our roots, we remember the foundation that started, the foundation that propelled us to be where we are today. And we can have new growth from those roots that last in the day and age in which we find ourselves. So I'm seeking to go back in history and to help us through this sermon series to look at some of the foundations that John Wesley, the founder of this denomination, felt in his heart and in his life that propelled this denomination to exist in the very first place. And today I want to focus us in on what Wesley called personal and social holiness. Now the danger is in this day and age there are congregations that focus solely on personal holiness and by that I mean they have reduced their faith to a me and Jesus faith. That following in the way of faith means that we come into a church and we worship and we pray daily and we read the scripture daily and we seclude ourselves from what's going on in the world. And we call what's going on in the world political stuff and secular stuff. And we don't want anything to do with that. We just want a me and Jesus to get my life right with Jesus. 
But then there are others who focus solely on the social faith, the social holiness. And they say, you know, there are so many evils out there in the world. We need to be working to right the wrongs of the world. And so we're going to engage in marches and we're going to engage in letter writing campaigns. And we're going to be out there doing good works. But my friends, our roots tell us that we need both. That our faith is not an either or. Our faith is a both and. Our faith calls us to a me and Jesus time that equips and empowers us to go out into the world and to do the works that Jesus has called us to do. You know, as I think about that, I remember reading a story about Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King Jr. is most remembered today for his social action, for his social holiness. But let me read you a story about Martin Luther King Jr., a story that reminds us that he had an epiphany, that he had a strong sense of a revelation of who God was and that God was with him always and that that is what empowered his ministry of social justice. He wrote in his book, Stride Toward Freedom, I was ready to give up. With my cup of coffee sitting untouched before me, I tried to think of a way to move out of the picture without appearing a coward in this state of exhaustion when my courage had all but gone I decided to take my problem to God with my head in my hands I bowed over my kitchen table and I prayed out loud the words I spoke to God that midnight are still vivid in my memory. I am here, taking a stand for what I believe is right, but now I'm afraid. The people are looking to me for leadership. And if I stand before them without strength and courage, they too will falter. But I'm at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I've come to the point that I can't face it alone. At that moment, I experienced the presence of the divine as I have never experienced God before. It seemed to me as though I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. And God will be at your side forever. And almost at once, my fears began to go. My uncertainty disappeared. I was ready to face anything. My friends, I share that story with you because the power and the passion and the reason that we as the people of Washington Street United Methodist Church do the things that we do and have the ministries that we have is because we believe in the truth of gathering together as a community and drawing our strength from hearing God's holy word from, from praying together, praying with and for one another, and the strong belief that God goes with us to do the work in this world. That's why we started so many small group ministries this past year. Small group ministries where we can engage in prayer and walking with one another and reminding each other of the scriptures each day. 
we are called to a personal holiness that empowers and equips our social holiness. One of the most important ways that we can show our love for God is by how we live our lives. And Jesus, in calling his first disciples, did not say, I want you to believe A, B, C, and D. His first call to those disciples was, follow me. Follow me. Do the things that you see me do, because this is the way to live out your faith. Do the things that you see me do. And so the disciples saw Jesus going off to a lonely place to pray, to draw strength from his heavenly Father, to empower and equip his ministry. The Holy Scriptures remind us that when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, he knew the Scriptures and he quoted them. When Jesus began his public ministry, he went to the temple and he read from the Holy Scriptures from the prophet Isaiah. Jesus' ministry was equipped and empowered by that personal holiness. And Jesus lived his life with social holiness, reaching out to touch and to spend time with the people, reaching out in compassion and love and nurture and care. One of the most important ways that we can show our love for God is by how we live our lives. When we leave this place of worship, our friends and our families should be able to tell a difference in us. What we hear from the Holy Scriptures, what we sing with our words, and the way that we engage with one another in this place should transform us so that the world becomes a better place. John Wesley always wanted the Methodist people to be better and to do better. He calls us to go on to perfection, which doesn't mean that we'll never make any mistakes. It means that we will continue to grow in that perfect love of loving God and loving neighbor as ourselves. Pastor Jimmy Brown tells a story about the first girl who ever caught his eye. He says they were in the second grade together. And up to that point, he confesses that he just wanted to throw rocks at girls. He didn't really care much about them. But in the second grade, there was this little girl. Her name was Sherry, and she had cute little pigtails on each side of her head. And she had one of these cute little dresses that had a big picture of a teddy bear on the front. And he just fell in love with her. But he stayed away. He didn't really know how to approach her until one day she passed a note in class to him. And her note said, do you love me? Yes or no? Well, Little Jimmy thought things were getting kind of serious with her right now. And he wasn't sure he really knew what love was. But he also knew that girls like to hear it a lot. So he said, yes, I love you. And at recess that day, Sherry came up to him with a big smile on her face. And she said, say it. And he said, say what? Say you love me. Well, he said, I guess that's what she wants, so I'll say it. I love you. And oh, she beamed. That was wonderful. Well, the next day, Sherry came up to him again, and she said, do you really love me? Well, what do you mean, he thought. 
A lot of boys say they like me, but not all of them really mean it. So do you really mean it? And he thought, well, gee whiz, you know, I gave you my G.I. Joe doll the other day. And I told the other boys not to make fun of you. So, you know, what else do you want me to do about it? And she said, well, if you really love me, you would hold my hand at recess. And so he reached out and he held her hand. And she said, you know, when you really love people, you show it. And you're not embarrassed to show it. Pastor Jimmy Brown said that that incident took place over 25 years ago. And yet, when he looks back on it, he starts to laugh a little bit. He laughs when he thinks about that second grade experience and how it has stayed with him for so long. And it amazes him how God can use ordinary things like that to drive home eternal and essential truths in our lives. To teach us about who God is and what God requires of us. and What it means to follow Jesus. He said he believes that God asks us the same question that little Sherry asked him. That God asks us, do you love me? Do you really love me? If so, it means you need to say it, which means spending time with me in prayer, spending time with me listening to my voice through the Holy Scriptures, spending time worshiping me, hearing my word, and being with others who are your siblings because we all belong to the same family. And it means showing it. Show it by the way you treat others. Show it by the way you live your life. For remember how Jesus told his disciples, if you do it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. Remember how the prophet Micah said, that all the Lord requires of us is that we show our love by doing justice, by loving kindness, and by walking humbly with God. Remember how one day a Pharisee came to Jesus and tested Jesus with a question, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. My friends, so often I see the church today practicing a counterfeit Christianity, a Christianity that does not display the things that the Lord requires of us. And so as we remember our deep roots as United Methodist, let us hold these two in tension. Let us practice a personal holiness by growing in our own personal relationship with God through his Son, Jesus Christ, knowing that the power of the Holy Spirit is with us. And let us also practice social holiness by showing the world the love of God at work, bringing about justice and healing and hope, both now and forever. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.